So good evening, everyone. Welcome to this today's session of Saturday's talk by General Technologies. We are honored to have today uh, Professor Chintamani Mahapatraji and is going to address us on the or enlighten us on the Ukraine war that's fallout on the global order in India. A brief introduction about Chintamani ji. Uh, he's a former Pro Vice Chancellor and Professor at School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Lal Nehru University, that is JNU. Honorary Chairperson at Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies. He's a member of Academic Council of Mizoram University and Chandigarh University. He is an editor of Indian Foreign Affairs Journal, which is published by the Association of Indian Diplomats. Recently, he was a Tagore Chairperson Professor at Yunnan University of China. He has conducted research in several US laboratory, libraries and in UK as well. Professor Mahapatra has authored four books, edited, co-edited four volumes, and has contributed chapters to about 30 edited books. He has published about 70 research articles in reputed journals. He has been awarded a number of international fellowships, such as Fulbright Fellowship, Commonwealth Fellowship, and visiting fellowships to undertake research in US, UK, Austria, Australia, and many other countries. He has been a visiting faculty in several reputed colleges and institutes. He is also a regular commentator in uh, 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 newspapers and audiovisual media on international affairs. Uh, so uh, we are so really honored to have you today at today's session, and we are definitely going to have a great insight on this topic from you, sir. Over to you. Uh, Namaskar. Good evening to all the people who are part of this webinar. I feel really honored and that uh, you have given me this opportunity. Joy New Technologies uh, has given me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you on a topic which affects every individual's life around the globe. Now, the theme is quite large <clears throat> and the issue is very complex. It has the military dimension and economic dimension and political diplomatic dimension. There are so many issues are there. But <clears throat> I'll speak in the simplest of language where we can understand each other better. I always feel <clears throat> that during the Q&A when you raise questions and make your observations, uh, the discussion becomes more lively than a long monologue by a lecturer. Uh, together we can learn uh, more about what is going on train in Europe and the world. Uh, together we can learn uh, more about what is going on in Ukraine, in Europe and the world. Now, I kept the topic as global fallout. There are so many wars taking place even now, a different kind of wars, internal wars or between countries. But the Ukrainian war has caught the attention of the globe. That is why there is a global implication of what is going on in the world today. When you talk about the global order, what do you mean by it? It is a political system, a diplomatic mechanism, certain amount of economic order, not very effective, but still useful international law. And then you have uh, a structured power configuration. There are some countries which are more powerful than others. Some countries play a more important role in rule setting and expect the rest of the international community to follow the rules and norms. And then you have very rich, wealthy countries in the world and extremely poverty-stricken countries in the world. Some countries are so powerful that they can destroy the world many times over. There are quite a few countries which can be captured by Delhi police in a few hours. They're so weak. So in this kind of complex uh, global system that we have today, how is the Ukraine war affecting them? <clears throat> It is affecting them in the following ways. Let me first describe the scenario. At the moment, we are witnessing military intervention by a military superpower on a very weak neighbor. The power asymmetry is rather too much between Russia and Ukraine. Secondly, it is such a war that it has united almost the entire Western societies and countries against Russia. <clears throat> so several countries have imposed sanctions against one country, Russia, which we have not seen any time in the past, history of international relations. So in a way, some kind of economic war is also going on. Number three, it is not just a question of a shooting war between the Russians and the Ukrainians 
the Russians have intervened, Ukrainians are defending themselves and giving back. <clears throat> it is also in a way increasingly becoming a proxy war, where the United States and some of NATO member countries, NATO means North Atlantic Treaty Organization, who are giving weapons of different kinds to Ukraine so that Ukraine can, Ukraine can fight a war with Russia. So in a way, it's a proxy war. It is not between the two superpowers. One, one superpower is actively involved in the war. The other one is helping uh, <clears throat> Ukraine in indirect ways. <clears throat> Another unique event which is affecting the global order is of course the COVID-19 pandemic which preceded the Ukrainian war. It generated tremendous amount of hardship for people around the globe, the companies, big companies, small companies, <clears throat> different kind of industries, entertainment, transport, even educational system. Every sector of the economy has been so badly affected. In a way, it has created a very unique <clears throat> health crisis around the globe and that health crisis is going on even now we are lucky in india but if you observe what is going on in the us in europe in japan in australia and many other parts of the world the virus is still uh, very powerful and uh, tens of thousands of people are getting affected on a daily basis when we talk about the global order and the big powers, we can see the following. Number one, a new kind of complex Cold War, Sith Yud, has started between the US and Russia. If you are familiar a little bit about the global order for about 40 years, after the end of World War II, you would remember that it was basically driven by the Cold War between the US and the former Soviet Union. Cold War simply meant there was no direct confrontation. The American and the Soviet armies never confronted, never fought a war anywhere in the world for about 40 years. But the proxy wars are going on all around. Vietnam War, Korean War, Afghanistan War were the major wars. Europe was divided. It was an ideological competition between the US and the USSR or the former Soviet Union. Now, when the Soviet Union collapsed in December 1991, a mighty power with thousands of nuclear weapons could not protect its territorial integrity and cracked up into 15 different republics. Practically, the Cold War ended. The US became supreme. They began to bask in the glory of now managing a unipolar world order. Earlier, bipolar, the two power centers. Moscow and Washington, now unipolar. Now, then we realized that 10 years after the Soviet collapse and the end of the so-called Cold War, another fascinating thing happened. About 15, 16 individuals like you and me, who were not soldiers, who did not have any weapons, who had no training in warfare of any kind. Most of them were from Asia, particularly West Asia, went to the US, learned how to pilot a plane, and then with a synchronized attack, uh, they rammed the aeroplanes into the most important symbol of wealth that was uh, World Trade Center in New York and the symbolic center of global military power, the Pentagon or the American Defense Department. The whole world was shaken, so were the Americans. Non-state actors, individuals did not use any missile. They used the aeroplane as the missile and the fuel tank is explosive and rammed into Walter Center. Then those who are basking in the glory of unipolar world order 
realized their vulnerability. And then, of course, all of you know the history, how the Americans, along with their NATO allies, intervened in Afghanistan, where Osama bin Laden, the brain behind the 9-11 terrorist attack, was in Afghanistan. Taliban refused to hand him over. Then there was a war. For 20 years, the Americans were fighting the war in Afghanistan. When the Americans were deeply involved up to the neck in Afghanistan, the Chinese began to make lots and lots of money. And then the US realized that China has come up as yet another rebel superpower. For 40 years, they fought with the Soviet Union. Soviet Union collapsed. Now China has come up as a new superpower, challenging the American hegemony or control, influence around the globe. As and when the Americans uh, decided to take on the Chinese, what I call my theory, some kind of cold confrontation, I will not say war, cold confrontation unfolded between the US and China. It would not be a cold war, a simple reason during the Cold War. The Soviet Union and the United States did not have any uh, substantive trade economic relationship. But over the years, China and the US economy are so entangled, so interdependent, that any kind of major Cold War would be suicidal for both the US and China. So a Cold War would not be possible. But the Cold Confrontation was unfolding in South China Sea and in so many other ways. They were competing with each other, checkmating each other, preventing each other from growing and doing business. Russia, in the meantime, which was the main, main body of the former Soviet Union, the main country, was literally ticked off as a major power. It's no longer a threat, no longer a power. You know, Europeans, Americans ignored Russia, marginalized Russia, began to build some kind of trade, energy, economic cooperation with them also. So now, instead of Soviet Union or Russia, now the China is the main goal. The Ukraine war symbolizes that Russia has become a resurgent geopolitical player yet again. It had given glimpses of its power and ability in some hotspots, like in Syria, when it captured South Ossetia of Georgia, when it annexed Crimea of Ukraine in 2014. The Western countries did not and could not do much, but did not take it very seriously. But when Vladimir Putin, the Russian president intervenes directly in Ukraine. Then, of course, the Americans began to head back. Now the question, what is going to happen? Who is going to win the war? Who is going to lose the war? In what way the global power structure will alter and in, uh, indirectly the global order will also be different from what it was. So, what are the outcome? Number one, in my view, a new kind of complex Cold War has been happening already between the US and Russia. Number two, the Cold Confrontation is taking a different shape. Chinese are worried that similar kind of containment should not be uh, targeted at China. But at the same time, they know that they have to support Russia. So Russia and China are now together to counter the American influence. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, basically consisting of Canada, US, and some of the West European countries, was expanding its membership. And one of the reasons why the war took place was Russians directly threatened that Ukraine should not become a member of NATO. Now, that NATO was almost undermined by the American President Donald Trump. And because of the Ukraine war, NATO, which was almost, uh, I will not say disintegrating, but was weakening by the day, 
again united. So this is a new change. In Europe, you have the NATO, which is very powerful, most powerful military organization. Then you have the European Union, which is basically a social, political, economic organization. European Union was regarded as the most successful regional grouping of nations. But because of the global uh, depression or recession, and then the Eurozone crisis, then Great Britain, which is a member of uh, EU, left EU, EU was weakening. Now what is going to happen? Now onwards, even if uh, the war ends, the American presence in Europe is going to be stronger yet again. European Union will be weaker. NATO will be more powerful. Russia will be more isolated in the global order. China will find it find itself to be the number one target. And in the process, that complex cold, cold confrontation will evolve. In all the changing dynamics, what is India going to do? Then I'll end, then we can have QA. Today, India is regarded as an economic powerhouse. India's GDP is now more than that of Great Britain. Of course, through PPP calculation. And then India has emerged as a nuclear weapon power. In spite of poverty, illiteracy, the way we evolved, today the whole world respects India as a dynamic democracy, a resilient democracy. The poor people, the elected people go and vote periodically and even change governments. So it is also emerging as an important global player. India is a member of G20, India is a member of Quad, Quadrilateral Security Initiative, US, Japan, Australia, India together. Uh, the meeting is going to take place again in Japan. So in a way, India has become truly a major power. It is under spotlight. Some of them think that India can handle the situation better. Narendra Modi ji has spoken to both Zelensky and Putin multiple times. Did not support Russia. Provided even humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Urging them to stop violence and start talking. This is what we could do. So I can visualize the future after the war when India will be strategically more autonomous but simultaneously friendly with both the United States and Russia although they don't get along with one. It is going to be difficult diplomatic tightrope walking sometimes but this is the only way we can go ahead. We cannot be part of any alliance and play second fiddle to the main uh, powerful partners. This is what India has been trying to do. And I think the same way India is going to move ahead. Finally, we can see a world where China after the war would appear to be more powerful because they are, see, the Americans have imposed sanctions. It's not only the Russians who are getting affected. All those countries which are buying Russian oil and gas and weapons and even agricultural products, they are getting it. China is not getting it. So China relatively will be more influential because even Russians are going to depend on China, sell them weapons and energy and so many other things. Russia, which is under the spotlight and the target of the Western countries, will find it to be more isolated in and among the developed countries. The US, everybody in the world thought that America is a relatively declining power. But the way Joe Biden is trying to play the leadership role in containing Russia in Ukraine and elsewhere, looks like the US is not retrenching from world affairs but getting, getting back to world affairs. The country is polarized. 
between the Republicans still under the influence of Donald Trump and the Democrats who are divided among the progressive and the left and the right of the center. So when one superpower is facing internal crisis of this kind, in November, most likely Xi Jinping is going to get another term of office. He's again the strong man of China. If the political leadership is weak, the country cannot play an important role in world affairs for sure. And the US alone cannot contain China. China alone will not be in a position to bring down the American hegemony. So ultimately, we are going to see Russia-China collaboration against the attempt to form a unilateral world order on a unipolar system. India will maintain itself as one among the many centers of power, but not side with any group of nations. This is what is most likely to happen. This Russia, uh, I mean, encroaching Ukraine, was it, was it uh, because Ukraine dismantled this uh, nuclear deterrence as a strategy where they went wrong because they trusted NATO and dismantled the, uh, uh, this thing, nuclear warheads or whatever they had? That is the first question. Second, uh, with the so much energy surplus and the European Union or uh, NATO countries not uh, energy sufficient, whether they can uh, isolate uh, Russia in a uh, physical sense or I mean in a long term because uh, the, I went in through a study where even the uh, solar energy to uh, I mean take a solar energy European need Union needs some millions of tons of metals uh, to prepare batteries so they are not at all prepared for this what one study says hmm. the third uh, point I was thinking is that Will it be a multi multipolar global order down the lines? Very briefly, I'll touch upon all the three questions so others can also come in. Uh, you know, when the Soviet Union disintegrated, there are a lot of nuclear weapons in Ukraine, in Belarus, in Kazakhstan and Russia. Both Russia and the United States did not want nuclear weapons to fall into the hands of smaller countries. So they were together in trying to dismantle the nuclear infrastructure in Ukraine and other countries. Ukraine had the maximum number. Very promptly, uh, Belarus and uh, Kazakhstan agreed. But they had an agreement, Budapest agreement uh, on Ukraine. And Ukraine was assured uh, protection, security, if it would give up all the nuclear weapons. Americans came very heavily upon them, assured them. Even Russia was interested in collaborating with the US in getting the weapons back. Ukraine did not have any nuclear weapons. Now, many Ukrainians and some nuclear experts are saying if only nuclear had one little bomb somewhere in the basement. Putin would not have dared to attack Ukraine. That is true. That's look at the way North Korea is treated and look at the way yeah. Iran is treated. Right? Now, the, some of the Ukrainians are, I think, repenting. Number two, your question about energy. You know, 40% of the Russian gas goes to Europe. The largest is Germany the most uh, powerful, uh, economically powerful country in, in Europe. Now, all this gas goes through pipelines. It is not easy to somehow just switch up and build up other pipelines, look for other sources. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. Germany has openly said that we can delink our energy collaboration with Russia only by end of 2024. At the moment, if the gas is cut off of the Germany doesn't buy, then it will make common people suffer like anything. And when the winter comes, people will die. Now, because of the sanctions, Putin actually, very recently, he gave them a kind of uh, trailer 
by cutting up gas uh, supply to Poland and Bulgaria. And my God, the Europeans have uh, woken up to the danger of not buying gas right now. The alternative to fossil fuel are good. They're increasing uh, in terms of um, you know their, their production and use and all, but cannot be a substitute at the moment. For quite a few decades into the future, oil and gas are going to be relevant. There's no doubt about it. Number three, the Americans want to help them, but American gas or uh, LPG coming all the way across the Atlantic it is going to raise the cost. Not affordable at all. To some extent, for some days, some weeks, it's okay. So, at the moment, it is not easy to cut. Even if, suppose, assuming that everything goes hunky-dory and they cut it off, Russia is an energy superpower. It will definitely have tremendous amount of influence in setting the international market price of oil. Sometimes too much of oil, it can reduce production. And too little oil in the market and the price is going up, it can increase production. So Russia will remain relevant. And your third question was about, uh, what, is, what was it about? Multipolar. Multipolar. Yeah. Actually, in a way, the world is multipolar already. Imagine in 1945 when Second World War ended, that was the time when the world was truly unipolar. The United States had monopoly over the nuclear weapon. And the United States accounted for 50% of the global output. Then four years later, the Soviet Union had the bomb and then Britain, then France, then China, and now India, even Israel has the capability. Even the Pakistanis have a couple of bombs. So all these power centers have come up. They cannot be at par with the Americans and Europeans in terms of their economic wherewithal. But in terms of destruction ability and creating nuisance, they cannot be dictated to. Uh, one is, is there a military intervention possible in Ukraine with the consent of both Russia and Ukraine? Why am I saying this is, both of them have faith in India, Indian policy. Russia does not want Western influence at all. China may or may not be uh, you know, uh, people may not have faith in them. Uh, and war is not ending without any external intervention. Putin initially thought that maybe in a week or two, he'll annex the whole of Ukraine, but he's not been able to do. So is there a possibility that with the understanding of both sides, Russia and Ukraine, India does some military intervention and makes sure that both of them put down the arms? Of course, the cost of Indian military going there will have to be borne by those two countries. You know, that is an ideal situation. But the Americans will not want Indian boots on Ukraine when they have found that India is not on board their policy. And the Russians will always say that we are the superpower. We will do whatever we want to do. And the Ukrainians, uh, you know, at, at the moment it's a symmetrical war going on. They would ideally ask Indian troops there. But India, even India will say no. For simple reason that uh, there was a suggestion in 2003-2004 about Indian boats in Iraq. George Bush requested the government of India. After due deliberation, government said, sorry, we are not going to send our troops there. Next question came, Afghanistan. NATO forces were not able to do anything vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban. And there was a request. Only India can do something about it. India said point blank, no. In the neighborhood, there was at one time a request from Sri Lanka. We did send IPKF or Indian Peace Queen Force to Sri Lanka. Did not stay on. When the new, new government came and said, you may go, we came back. In East Pakistan, we defeated the Pakistanis uh, in a matter of uh, a couple of weeks. The 90,000 prisoners of war. If we wanted, we could have stayed on and made Bangladesh part of India. We did not do that. We came back. So the Indian policy will not support an idea of sending troops to Ukraine. However, if anything is likely, if at all things go that way, 
it can only be under the UN flag. And there will be multiple number of countries which will contribute troops towards peacekeeping. UN peacekeeping is probable and possible. My second question is about food shortage. How does this conflict affect food production across the world to feed Tremendous. 7 billion people? Yeah, yeah. Tremendously, because for two reasons. Number one is disruption in the supply chain. Number two is Ukraine and Russia, you know, they import a considerable amount of wheat and fertilizer. Fertilizer is important for crops and even food grains are sold. And because of the war, large number of countries, most of them in Africa, they're starving. Now, India has food surplus. India would like to give uh, food, supply food to th those parts of the world. And very funnily and interestingly, the WTO rules would not permit India to send, uh, uh, to send uh, food grains. So India is now urging the um, international community, uh, the WTO rules should be amended so that India can go and sell uh, the food grains to those countries who, which would like to buy this. The Indian uh, farmers are in a way lucky because of the food shortage, they, our Ravi fossil and other fossil is really going to do well now with food surplus. But the import of fertilizer is affecting India negatively a little bit. So the situation is grim, partly because of the pandemic, and the food crisis and now because of the war it is a major problem thank you